Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Parish Art Museum. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the Senior Curator of Arts Age and Special Projects. And it is my distinct pleasure to uh, be showing you a film that I would call a poetic art world thriller. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't like that. But, no, I like it. Um, it's the, called The Proposal. It's by the artist and filmmaker Jill Maggot, who is right here in the beautiful bright dress. And I'm also pleased to welcome Matilde Guidelli uh, from the Dear Art Foundation. And I would like to thank our sponsors who make these Friday night programs possible. First and foremost, uh, Bank of America, our presenting sponsor, as well as the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. So, um, and oh, I want to thank, of course, Jackie LoFaro, who is from the Hamptons Dog Fest, our wonderful partner. Throughout the years, throughout the pandemic, we stayed friends, we, we kept partnering, we made it happen. So thank you, Jackie, so very much. All right, let's get started. Yes. Um, Jill, I, um, I have to obviously ask you what prompted you to make this film. You're, foremost, you're mostly known as, as an artist, a conceptual artist. Um, you do performances as well. And um, you made this film a couple of years ago. Um, so what prompted you to do that? Okay. So as Corinne said, I make work in all different media. And I've made a lot of video works uh, through my career, but I had never made a feature film before, so this is my first one. And the project in which the film sits within, the larger project, is called The Barragon Archives. And this film comes in kind of the second chapter of a longer exploration about copyright and control of an artist's legacy. I won't say too much. Um, but the first chapter, I was making a series of artworks and installations that you'll see pieces of in the film. And then the second chapter, I was working on the proposal is about, and it was also going to be an installation in a show, and it was, but in the process of making it, I met the filmmaker, Laura Poitras, who maybe some of you know, she's an excellent filmmaker, and she made Citizen Four about Snowden's um, coming out of, of about Russia and surveillance. Um, and while I was making a project for her, she was like, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm waiting for approval of the Mex from the Mexican government to do something. And she was like, are you filming that? And so I said, no. And she said, write me a proposal. And I did. And three days later, I had a cinematographer and we got to work on what was going to be a short film that grew into a feature. Um, but I would say that my work has, it always has a kind of narrative, or it often has a narrative, a kind of epic search following a question. Um, and so that really lends itself to narrative form. So I write books and I'd always been really interested in making a film. So I was extremely excited by the possibility and opportunity to make a film. It didn't come out of nowhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we should take a step back and just explain who Luis Barragan was. He was a very well-known Mexican architect, wonderful architect. And I believe that when you started to investigate his work, uh, you found out that the archive was actually not really available. And probably that's what led you to that investigation to, to that film? Yeah, well, my work is, broadly speaking, I'm really interested in power and control. Usually, uh, throughout my earlier work, it was much more about federal government and government power, like surveillance, and what, uh, what kind of individual agency citizens have in the face of these larger systems of control that we're faced with every day that we might just accept. Um, but what happens when we start like talking back or want to feel that there can be a dialogue rather than a one-way form of surveillance? So 
I'm like forgetting the train of the question. So why did I, why did I, yes. So as you'll see in the film, Louis Barragon, I don't want to explain much because the film does, does that work, but he was an amazing architect and I was very moved by his work. But the questions that I'm asking the fi in the film are larger than his own legacy and they uh, completely coincide with my larger investigations of power and access. And what does it mean when, in this case, an artist's work is not accessible to a wide variety of people? And what happens to an artist's legacy when, when work is only available to a chosen View. And, you know, I think those are really important questions. So it drove the project. Yeah. So something, Jill, that, well, first of all, that brings me here as well is that, and something that you said earlier, Jill, for those of you who don't know, Jill has an exhibition at Dia Bridgehampton that closes this weekend. So if you have not seen it, or even if you have seen it, this is the last chance. And it's an exhibition which as much as we are here to talk about a movie that Jill made, it's an exhibition that actually consists of 11 silk screens on linen. It's called, the series is called Homage CMYK. The silk screens are hung at the Abridge Hampton to fit the gallery in an immersive installation. And we can say that the point of departure for the silk screens was to unlicense copies of a very iconic work, The Homage to the Square by Josef Albers that hang in Barragan's house in Mexico City, which is the stage of most of the movie that we are about to watch. And what is interesting to me is that the silk screens layer both the fake Albers, the shadows of Barragan's architecture, and then eventually their, their respective reproductions, and then your own decision of making them into four-channel silk screens. So I think what you said earlier, Jill, about often you joke that you don't really have a signature style but that you, <laughs> or a brand, but that you, but certainly you have a specific method and, and questions, and certainly the silk screen um, just as the film further some of the questions that you were asking in the film. So perhaps something that could be interesting to think through is how by asking these larger questions to larger systems, how do you go about in your process and how then the work takes these different forms that can be a film, a book, or an artwork? How do you choose your medium and how it comes out of this different um, exploration and questions. Yeah, I think um, this, the show and the film actually have a really interesting relationship in terms of, although they're two-dimensional works, they're almost like time-based paintings because the layers of the circulation of these images through photography and different forms of reproduction and layers of authorship as well. Um, because I think authorship, in general, there's kind of a myth of the single author. And that doesn't mean like I'm not the director of the film. It means that there's like so many layers of voices and people doing things that inspire and we build off of. But that can't happen when an archive is closed away mm -hmm. and no one can access it. So it's also about like trusting the artwork to have an agency of its own and letting other artists engage with it. But um, like Mathilde said, you know, be, I work in all these different media because the question is really what drives the work. That doesn't mean I don't care a lot about the form and the material. I think. It's important, almost like going back to what Corinne said of like why this film, why this proposal, I really believe that if you wanna ask hard questions that are sometimes uncomfortable and confront power, if you ask a question directly, you kind of know the answer you're gonna get. But if you come from a totally obtuse angle and you turn it slightly upside down, and you, you ask the question that way, maybe suddenly people will hear it. 
in another way. And so I really think about the different forms I use and the different audience. So for me, it was really important that the film um, is not like an art film that goes in a gallery, but it really occupied the space of cinema. And it had like a very specific kind of movement through time, whereas the show at Dia Bridge Hampton, it's kind of like you see time all at once, mm -hmm. you know? And um, if hopefully you get a chance to see it, it sort of moves from night to day mm -hmm. in, a, in a way. And so I just think it's really exciting to use different materials to create different feelings and different experiences and ask sometimes the same question, just in a really different way. So I think this whole notion that you just mentioned, the notion of the, the passage of time and what happens to the work of an artist you know, throughout the passage of time, what happens um, to it um, by the people who use it, who, in, who do interpretation of that yeah. kind of work, I think is an extremely important question. Yeah. And I think for you as an artist also, it's like, how do you want to be seen after your life? You know, totally. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want your material to be used? And can it be bought up? You know, yeah. can it be a transactional thing, where mm -hmm. as someone buys it up, and which, as you will see in this film, in the extreme case, kind of lock it, you know, lock it down and make it inaccessible mm -hmm. out of fear, so to speak, mm -hmm. that something wrong might happen. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I mean, as an artist, do you have real thoughts about what you want to happen to your material? After yeah, you I mean, after, you know? I, I really, I don't have like exact thoughts, you know, but I want the work to keep provoking questions and like <laughs> continue to be meaningful. And I think as an artist, you, you certainly cannot control that. What you, once you put an artwork out in the world, you know, you can do as much as you can to get it ready, but once it, you know, it hits the public, it's out of your control. And then also, like we see all the time with political changes, work that may have seemed innocuous 30 years ago suddenly might come off as like really insensitive mm -hmm. racially or gender wise or um, who's in museums and who isn't. I mean, we're in a museum now and we're so fortunate, you know, to walk through and look at people's work and hopefully by juxtaposing works next to each other, including works, having a more diverse um, way of viewing it and thinking through the work can stay alive. But that's what I meant about having to trust the work, you know? So I don't always control how the, the work is, this piece is provocative. Like some people get, got mad, you know? I, can, and, I could see that. Yeah, it's and very some people get mad, but you know what? Like, I think that art, I really believe that art can ask questions in ways that like wouldn't work in another like a journalist couldn't ask the questions in the same yeah. way because it's kind of like you're leading the witness yeah. or something you know but as an artist like I believe that we should be able to ask questions and that if they provoke a debate as long as it's a good debate you know what I mean I do I do think there's like provocative for provocative sake and I'm not interested in that I'm interested in like a really good dialogue and even being even learning myself from mm -hmm. it it's not like I start a piece and I know the answer I start a piece because I have the question mm -hmm. but sometimes all of a sudden you know one can say that well there are many questions that we can ask and it's tricky to navigate how to ask the questions given that we still have to watch the movie together. right 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 <laughs> but <laughs> one thing that for sure comes to mind is that it's not that you, find an, you found answers, but definitely you found ways of represent Baragan in spite of the fact that the right to its image, and then the image of his architecture, and as well as his own image, is right now uh, under exclusive control. So there are many questions that come to mind, and now I kind of lost my train of thought. But I guess the question is, there is this fine line that I think you illuminate by asking... Um, a question of what it means for an artist's legacy to be owned by a private corporation. Somehow there are ways in which these two works, the work at Dia and the film that we're about to watch, propose alternative ways to think about ownership that can be 
relationship rather than ownership, for instance, yeah. so bringing up the friendship between Albers and Baragan, or the mutual respect that existed between these two you know, giants of modernism, and that allowed you, in a way, to insert yourself into representing Baragan through, as you said, oblique yeah. uh, ways, but also to bring, us, uh, to bring attention to the fine line that runs between you know, protection and stewardship, which is what is also the mission not only of the Baragan archives, but yeah. also museums, and Corinne and my job is somehow is, mm-hmm. is, is that, uh, stewarding the work of artists, but at the same time bringing up the question of the fine line that runs between stewardship and uh, protection and care versus exclusive control. Yeah, and I don't think it's... Um, these are very complicated questions, and I... I don't think like one size fits all exactly. in any situation, you know, I think, and that's why I guess I wouldn't be a lawyer or, you know, cause you do need to kind of write something that is one size fits all, right. right? You know? So I think, I think it's, I don't take on that responsibility. It's more about, I think care is a really beautiful way to put it because Hopefully, the feeling is that you are trying to care for the work. And so where, where do you, how do you care for the work, but also let the work live, right? And trust the work that like various interpretations don't go necessarily canceling one another out, but like offer different interpretations and letting the work do that. And so when I saw that it, the, the show at... Um, Dia is based off these two fake Albers, that they're not even real Albers, they're just... That we um, will see in the film. Yeah, you see them in the film, and everyone thinks that they're real Albers, but they're not. They're not even exactly square, like I measured them. Um, But Albers and Baragon totally knew that they were fake. Baragon bought them for $2 at a strip mall. But Albers understood that Baragon earnestly respected Albers's work and he didn't for him and you see I don't want to give too much I'm saying if this is in the film but basically like Baragon loved the work felt connected to it and didn't feel the need to have the original he just wanted a reference to it to remind him of that work and Albers understood that and I found that to be this really beautiful foil that you know, the, the, you, it's not one or the other, like you buy it and so you have control or you do this. Like there's a lot of gray space in between mm-hmm. that's really amazing, mm-hmm. like that kind of relationship. Right. And, and I think that brings us also back to, you know, that question, what happens to your artwork, you know, what, in terms of interpretation. Yeah. You know, anyone can in, do whatever they want, basically, once, you know, it's out there. And, and I think mm-hmm. that is what is so fascinating in, in this case is that somebody really wanted to lock away any of these possibilities, which are also creative possibilities. Mm. And I'm also interested in, maybe to conclude this, but, you know, why did you choose uh, the format of a film? And at the same time, performance, you know, I think the yeah. proposal is, is kind of a, it's a performance, it's a yeah. provocative performance, and then in the format of a film, ultimately. Yeah. And do you think that you were able to achieve what you wanted with the Yeah. Film? I think it's also about audience that there's, you can experience the proposal installation. And in that case, um, although I made the show in a way that you can move, you move through the space, unlike an installation, in an installation, you can't control the movement of the viewer. You can't say, I want you to look at this piece for five minutes and then I want you to turn left and look at this piece like it's, but a film, you, unless you don't like it and you wanna leave, (laughs) like it's 83 minutes and as the director, I'm controlling the speed in which things are revealed, information is dropped. Like it's just a very different, experience and it asks some of the same questions as the artwork but not exactly the same because the juxtap sculptures take over you know you can make a sculpture with something in mind but once it's a material and you walk away it does something else and that's Mm -hmm. why I love making sculpture because Mm -hmm. I can like do all the drawings but then you walk away and you're like oh I didn't realize that that kind of wood with 
you know, next to that other softer object will set off different emotions, you know? Um, whereas in the film, it's like the way the work is shot, the voice, it just works on these different levels. And so um, I, I really believed it could work as a film. There were definitely times along the way <laughs> that I was scared that it, it wouldn't, but I think that's the creative process. You know, you kind of struggle with it until it gets to a point where you're like, yes, that's, that's right. And in retrospect, you know, with the reactions to the film, do you feel like it was the right decision? Well, I think it's brought up a hell of a lot of debate. <laughs> and so, um, so that I really like, but I will say that there's been a lot of feedback of it as a piece of cinema. So I've given a lot of talk, like it's had a long festival run. It played for six weeks at IFC. It's it distributed all over the United States and Canada and played in Europe. And I really care about it as cinema. You know, it's and not it just the, the question. World, which I think was totally. Yeah. And it's not yeah. just like the question is super important. It won't work as yeah. a film if the questions aren't clear. But like I wanted to direct a good piece of cinema. Mm -hmm. And so that I feel extremely fortunate for having the opportunity to do. And you can decide as the audience if it if it worked <laughs> or not. Do you wanna... I think we can. <laughs> Beautiful way of concluding. Absolutely. So well, thank you for, for thank you, screening it. Thanks for all being here. Thank you, thank Jackie. You, thank you, Matilde. Thank, thank you, Jackie. Thank you for coming.